And beginning in the uh, very beginning of 19, uh, the summer there of 1981, Courtney Hunt was asking me a question I really didn't want to be asked. And that question was, so tell me, do you want to go to Mars? And then in the late June of 1981, I, I said, why should I go? Why are you asking me to go to Mars? And he said, because the survival of human life depends on it. I'm speaking out now for two reasons. One is we're going to be needing this technology to save our civilization. So I think that's important a reason enough. People, I think, also have a human right, a birthright, to a true telling of the natural history of the solar system that we inhabit. Is not this dangerous for you to, to, to speak about all this? Yes, and I've realized since the inception of my investigation that I might be assassinated for carrying out my investigation of such a sensitive topic. But that's a risk that I'm willing to take. We shouldn't be keeping the fact that Mars is inhabited and we're visiting it uh, secret for as long as we've kept teleportation secret for another 40 years. That's wrong. <laughs> teleportation has been used since at least around 1980 to place human personnel on Mars. Why do I know that? I know that because I participated in later activities in which that is what we were doing. My father and I first jumped through a, a Tesla teleporter in Building 68 at the old Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Woodridge, New Jersey sometime between September of 1967 and September of 1968. Well, the first trip that I took via teleportation was with my late father, Raymond F. Bashago, who was an electrical engineer with the Ralph M. Parsons Company, which was then based in New York City. Today it's based in Pasadena, California. Because when the tunnel closed and we arrived via teleportation uh, in the state capitol complex in Santa Fe, New Mexico, my father then got a state car from one of the, one of the public buildings there and we drove over to the Los, Alamo, Los Alamos National Laboratories for a meeting with Dr. Harold M. Agnew when he was the director of the W Division, the Weapons Division at the Los Alamos Labs. When we met with Dr. Agnew, there was a conversation between my father and Dr. Agnew as to how we had arrived there. He said to my father, how was your trip, presumably, possibly by airplane from New York or New Jersey uh, to New Mexico? And my father looked up at him somewhat mischievously and said, fast. He, he, said, he said, fine and fast. And, and Dr. Agnew looked, looked up from his desk and smiled and said, oh, did you, did you take the teleport? And my father, who was sitting on my left, turned to me and he said, yes, and I, so did my young son, Andrew. And then Dr. Agnew looked over at me and, and said, how old? In other words, how old is your son? And my father and I then said simultaneously, six. So we know that that meeting with Agnew had to have taken place between September of 1967 and September of 1968 because I was born in September of 1961. And I was brought into the time travel um, program at the time of its emergence because they had different research and development goals that involved children. When I was trained on Project Pegasus that they were utilizing 140 American school children. Was it dangerous for children? Yes, it was new, dangerous, and experimental when we began teleporting. So they were actually training us to contingency plan for the possibility that we might be lost in time, which was a very fearsome thing to contemplate uh, for those of us in the program. We were concerned about literally leaving this time and being stuck in another one. One, they wanted to test the mental and physical effects of teleportation on children. Two, they had these electro-optical devices called chronovisors that prompted moving holographic images of past and future events. The third purpose is that they knew that children are exceptionally accurate in their observations, or at least they tend to be much more accurate than what adults report that they're seeing. Their perceptions are not influenced in the way that adults' perceptions are by the selection bias of what they have previously experienced. The fourth reason, and, and, and that which we were most excited about, is they told us that in adulthood we would be admitted to the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis and that would be used as a pretext to involve us in future time travel activities, that we were being trained to become America's first cadre of chrononauts in a secret program that would, would run parallel to the U.S. space program. What are, we trying, what are we doing trying to fund teleportation when it's existed for 40 years? I'm not lying. I can give you, I can give you the, the names of, of the locations we were taken to where events, uh, time travel uh, activities occurred. I can give you the name and describe the, structural, the structure and function of the devices. I'm giving the name not only of Project Insiders whose names will show up in government records, as a result of entering certain facilities or having security uh, badges and so forth. I can give you the names of their friends in places like New Mexico and New Jersey who were aware of what was going on. Nikola Tesla found a way to create an apparatus 
that draws radiant energy from the time-space continuum. Radiant energy is a form of energy that he discovered. It is latent and pervasive in the universe. My father and I first jumped through a, a Tesla teleporter in Building 68 at the old Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Woodridge, New Jersey, sometime between September of 1967 and September of 1968. We know that because we arrived in the state capitol complex in Santa Fe. The teleport would open up a tunnel in the time-space continuum. You would find yourself moving through it. And when the tunnel closed, you would find yourself elsewhere on the surface of, of the planet. So uh, in July 1981, uh, I met him at the corner of Mason and Devonshire in Chatsworth, California. Uh, in his car, we drove to the office building that is at uh, the corner of North Sepulveda Boulevard and Imperial Boulevard, immediately southeast of the, the grounds of the Los Angeles International Airport. The address of that building is 999 North Sepulveda Boulevard. And he, Courtney Hunt was speaking to me through the telecom and saying, are you ready, and so forth. And I finally grew impatient because I wanted to go to Mars. I don't like waiting for things. <laughs> And I, I, I borrowed a line, I believe, that was from Alan Shepard during the, the space program, which was, light this candle. Maybe it was John Glenn. But I, 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 I cribbed some, some wording from one of the American astronauts, and I said rather impatiently, light this candle. I was really growing exasperated. I couldn't tell that much was happening. All that was happening was that panels of light on the top and bottom of the elevator started blinking. And then about... 10 minutes into the 20 minute journey to Mars, the entire form of this box-like elevator began to morph and, and crumple and reposition itself into a cylinder. And when I looked, when that happened, I had to steady myself in the elevator, such as you would if you were walking through a water main. You know, you're walking in a cylindrical object, so you have to kind of steady yourself. And I saw that the ceiling had become the surface I was looking at, and I could see this sort of swirling pattern. They had opened up a vortal tunnel in the fabric of time space, just as the teleporter did back when I was a child on Project Pegasus. And that lasted for maybe two to four minutes or so, and then, I, then it began, the cylinder, and then it began correcting itself, and then it just completely rectified its original uh, shape. And then about 10 minutes later, as Courtney had described, the door opened, and I walked out into what looked like, if you can imagine sort of the basement of a modern sports arena, the infrastructure of that built into an existing ca underground cavern of an ancient civilization. There was sort of a big cave in which I could see these modern tension struts, a sort of infrastructure that had been placed inside, and the jump room itself had been placed inside this ancient cavern. I walked through what was clearly the irregular eye sockets of some kind of skull on the surface. I, could s I turned around, I could see it was a skull. I could see the rust red terrain of Mars. I could see that Mars has a pale blue sky. I could see that, or sense rather, that, that Mars smelt of gunpowder, which must have been some sulfur uh, content, at least at that location. What is the temperature on Mars? Uh, what do they eat on Mars? It was about 70 degrees. Now, the conventional scientific literature about Mars states either that Mars is prohibitively cold or that Mars has temperate regions that would be survivable by humans. I don't know where I was sent via the jump room at 999 North Sepulveda Boulevard in El Segundo, the Hughes building that the, that the jump room was in. All I know is that they sent me. And I turned and I saw a small human being from our civilization on Earth run up to me. And then two more individuals a couple years older than me. I would say they were maybe 21, 22, 23 years of age, ran up to me. Two, two men and, and, and a woman. And I was interacting with the, the first individual who ran up to my location. And they were clearly human beings from Earth. They weren't Martians. They looked normal. They were speaking English, too. That's one of the bases? I think it might be a base. What we can say is that it's, this is a, a detail. It's an enlargement of a segment of one of the glass tubes that have been found in, in various places on Mars. They seem to be artificial structures that have been built around this ribbing, and then some kind of glassine substance has been extruded across the reinforcements. That uh, photograph has been the subject of widespread global scrutiny because it contains an anomaly that apparently looks like the figure of a human female in a blue dress on the far leftward or, or southward edge of the home plate plateau. It was that the U.S. government achieved time travel 40 years ago, <clears throat> pardon me, and was using it to reach Mars at least no later than 30 years ago. And when they were spending those trillions of dollars in America's defense labs, they weren't just making 
uh, superior forms of nuclear weapons. They were spending trillions of dollars on all manner of technologies that remain secret. Rumsfeld and Governor Richardson to step forward and I'm asking those two to man up and tell the world the truth and that is that they were directly involved in the project that I was on. They as career public servants actually distinguished public servants certainly they can now step forward as former cabinet officers and, and support what I'm saying because they were direct participants in what the program achieved. Hold on, my dad was a great guy. Sorry. And then he said, then I want you to tell the whole world because what we were part of was something great. This is the future and people deserve to know what we achieved. The Time-space pioneer children were not individuals like myself. We were in the second group. The first children to teleport and literally become inhabitants of the time-space age were kids from Latin America. So I don't believe that it's my responsibility to convince people of the truth. I think it's my, my responsibility to simply stand in my truth and tell it. And so that's why I'm speaking out. And I, I recognize that that was a privilege. And certainly telling the story of those, those technical achievements because of the value that they could bring to our global civilization is more important than worrying about whether I'm going to be killed or not as a result of, of coming forward. Is not this dangerous for you to, to, to speak about all this? Yes, and I've realized since the inception of my investigation that I might be assassinated for carrying out my investigation of such a sensitive topic. But that's a risk that I'm willing to take I'm pursuing a cause that I'm not willing to postpone and I believe that I will prevail at. And that is to inform the people of the world that for 40 years we've had available to us this revolutionary form of transportation that we could use to directly implement to achieve sustainability in the 21st century. That's the world that awaits us in the 21st century will be Nikola Tesla because those devices were left in his paperwork that he left at his death in 1943. In order to do that, we're going to have to become a time-space-faring civilization.